I think my path in business has been good because I've always been able to spot an opportunity and understand mm. when you're into something really good or there's something really good in front of you. And you combine that with my own work ethic and ambition. You know, if there's opportunity and ambition, like when they meet, like it, force. it's a great um, place to be. The Architects of Business on Joe, in partnership with the EY Entrepreneur of the Year programme, telling the inspirational stories behind Ireland's most successful entrepreneurs. Hello and welcome back to the Architects of Business on Joe, made in partnership with EY Entrepreneur of the Year, where you will hear the inspirational stories of some of Ireland's most successful entrepreneurs. I'm your host, Sonia Lennon, and today I am talking with David Maxwell. He's the managing director of burrito chain Bougem. The company started in 2007 in Belfast, but David bought it over in 2015 and has turned what was a tiny bar into one of the leading lights in fast casual dining in Ireland. David Maxwell, you are Mr. Bougem. <laughs> Welcome to the couch. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you. Yeah. An absolute pleasure. What a success story. Any business uh, that has queues down the road, that's a pretty good sign, isn't it? Well, it is, yeah. Thankfully, we have a few queues outside most of our stores, which is... Um, and they're not your family? They're definitely not my family. <laughs> I'd have to have a big family. But yeah, no, it's good. It's, it's a good sign that the, the business is doing well and healthy and long may it continue. Absolutely. So... Uh, I'd love to go back to the beginning, which yeah. we always do, which is to talk about your upbringing, yeah. um, the influence that your parents had on, yeah. on your choices yeah. and, and your life yeah. and what sort of situation you grew up in. Yeah, so I, um, I have a brother, Andrew. Two of us grew up together, mum and dad, four of us in the house from East Belfast. Um, a very normal uh, upbringing, um, very happy memories of four of us together. Um, you see, some would say that's not normal. Yeah, well, no, 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 we have a great relationship. Um, there's only a, a year and a half gap between myself and my brother. And, uh, you know, we've, we've done most things together since childhood, Brilliant. so it's, it's been good. Uh, Mum and Dad were very normal, hardworking people, just, you know, taught us the value of a good work ethic. And What did they do? Getting up every day. My dad was in the building trade, mm -hmm. and Mum was a, a kind of a shop manager. Okay. So, okay. yeah. They uh, got up every day and showed us the value of putting your head down and working hard. And that's just, you know, a good lesson that stayed with me ever since. And it's funny, I, I was having a discussion about this the other day. C consistency and competence and graft. Yeah. They're deeply unsexy uh, sort of subjects. Yes. A and yet, I think they're integral to, to really solid success. Yes. Well, I would agree. So we, we have a thing in our business we talk about is consistent execution um, and that's doing the boring things right every time and that's what makes a great business uh, and then innovating in and around that so don't lose the sight of the fundamentals that make your business great and it can be boring and repetitive but that is the dedication, that you need to put dedication into that to make sure your business works and survives and continues to grow. The good news is, I suppose, that as, as we develop that understanding and the value of consistency, yeah. it becomes habitualized. So you don't even see it. Yeah. You just do it. Yeah, it does. You form kind of patterns and, and behavior. But um, like anything else, you put you know, new staff into that pattern and behavior. You're constantly retraining and showing people and trying to evolve as well within that without breaking the model. But it's not easy. Uh, especially in our business. You're talking about the same things every day, um, hammering home the same message every day, and you have to do that. You can't get off message and you can't get off the path that you've chosen because it, it's very easily done. And, and it, it is about consistency and it is about execution and it is about competency and understanding you know, what your mission is and what you're trying to achieve and what your goals are um, and just getting up every day and trying to hammer that home. And how do you weave uh, evolution into that consistency? It's difficult um, because w our model is um, we won't innovate just for the sake of it. It has to add value to what we're doing. Um, evolution is important. I could give you 10 brands who failed to evolve or didn't ignore evolution or trends around them and are five years later wondering what happened. Why, you know, why, wh where did our customers go? Well, actually, Jamie Oliver is, yeah. is a case in point yeah. there. Yeah, I there are a few people have made those comments. I'm not sure whether I agree or not. I haven't really looked into it. 
you know, wouldn't be a, a, you know, in and out of his restaurants every day, so I couldn't really comment. But I did read the same things, and so you do have to be mindful of it. And you know, I do. I read industry news every single day and try and keep on top of the trends to make sure that we are following what's happening in and around us. But we don't. How much time do you dedicate to that every day? Do you have a a, a behavioural pattern around that? I, I actually have one that's developed now. So I have my inbox set up. I probably have three or four industry newsletters that come in every morning, and three or four kind of. Um, aggregated emails that come in at the end of the day. So I try and start my day with reading something new, what's happening in the week, what's happening in the future, and at the end of the day, try and fill a little bit as well. And I do, so I do a lot of bedtime reading too. So I just, I'm a bit of a sponge like that, you know, try to take in as much as I can and, and use the information as best I can in the business. And that's the fuel for, for the business and evolving the business so that it's fit for purpose. And I think that fit for purpose piece is, yeah. you know, when, when somebody walks into uh, a business offering, yeah. if it doesn't feel right for the time and yeah. for the culture and for the society, yeah. the, the, you know, that's what we need to evolve, evolve yeah. and, and, and to avoid, I suppose, is that moment where actually you've missed the beat. Yeah. And I love that idea that you're constantly futurizing your thinking around the sector to yeah. be ready for that. Yeah. Like uh, 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 what's driving a lot of change in our business at the moment is convenience. Customers are looking for you to be everywhere, multi-channel. I want my food at this time of day, in this location, at home, you know, and you have to adapt to that. And so the business we have today versus the business we had four years ago is very different. 20% um, of our sales originate on digital platforms now. We had 0% um, four years ago, and that's that's now influencing store design and layouts and you know customer behavior is influ is just changing how we look at our entire business i suppose and ask me what does that look like in another 4 years time you know it's really interesting to see the new technology that's coming in and evolving um and we we will we've made a commitment to kind of try and lead in that space and certainly um sit on that crest of the wave of, of change uh, and make sure that we move with it fantastic yeah. Fantastic. So wh how old were you when you moved to the States? I was 21, okay. I think. So very young. You and your brother? No, just me. So my brother was a professional rugby player and had a great career playing rugby for Ulster. Um, I, on the other hand, was a, a field rugby player who thought he wanted to be an, aer an aeronautical engineer, uh, realised, you know, few years into my degree it wasn't for me and kind of backed out of that degree and followed my passion. But if we went back a little bit you yeah. had been working from the age of 14. I had so uh, just back to the kind of work ethic that mum and dad kind of instilled in us. Uh, I love working from I was 14. I love having my own money and the ability to fund certain parts of our lifestyle. Don't get me wrong it wasn't much but you know mum and dad support us really well. But um, I just love working, and I particularly love working in bars. So my, my cousin gave me my first job collecting glasses in a bar. And you don't realise at the time what's happening. I just thought I was getting a few quid at the end of the, the week to go out with your mates. But really what I was developing was a passion. And I'm what has now become a multi-layered learning experience all the way through my industry that I lean on today. So, you know, so it's I, like compound interest, isn't yeah, it? You just, uh, yeah, I think so. You, yeah. you, you don't realise at the time. But like, there's plenty of situations I was in when I was, you know, learning this business from 14 to 21 prior to my move to America that I, I talk about today. You know, I'll have conversations with team member, team members, and you can. There's a level of empathy that comes with that because you understand how difficult the day is because you've been there. What it's like dealing with big queues and busy bars and machinery breaking down and not having this, not having that, and you know, so that is important. And actually, thankfully. Every single member of our senior management team has had a similar experience. And so I think it really is great values to have in our business. Like we're not led by a team of consultants or a team of, you know, management, senior managers with no experience, with a finance background. We are career, you know, passionate industry professionals who have come up through every single layer. Oh, it sounds like a t-shirt. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And is that baked into your HR uh, yeah. policy then? Absolutely. We, we have policies and values in our business that are, are definite um, results of our experiences in other businesses and through our lives, 100%. We are clear on that and, and, and we write our policies. We think of our, our staff members first uh, in everything. 
Um, we've won awards for that. We've been ranked a, a great place to work um, multiple times now. Um, and so it's good to, good, good to get that recognition, but it, it does all stem from having that level of empathy and understanding how difficult everybody's role is in this business. And it's not an MD getting up every day, trying to figure out what Bruton's gonna do next. It's 500 people getting up every day and just committing to whatever job they have within the business. And that's what makes us tick. Amazing. So the experience in, in America then. Yep. You were in Arizona. Yep. God's own country. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so look, I, as I said, I, I jacked in university and had... How far did you get? I think uh, part way through my third year. Uh-huh. I probably tailed that out a bit. I probably really, in my head... Checked out. Checked out a long time ago <laughs> yeah. and just dragged that out. But there was a bit of a, you know, you didn't want to disappoint your mum and dad. No one in my family had ever gone to university, never mind gotten a degree. Um, so there was not pressure, but like it, it was something that self imposed was, sense of pride. Yeah, yeah. but my mum and dad were so supportive no matter what I did. And so they were proud and happy for me to go to university and, and supported me financially and meant whatever was required to send your kid off to Scotland that was in Glasgow. Um, I couldn't have asked for any more. And so there's a little bit you're like, you don't let anyone down. But equally, when I got to that moment and I knew this wasn't for me, the phone call home was not difficult. And if anything, they were even more supportive of the decision. You know, I was leaving a potential professional career behind to go and take a job that didn't pay very much uh, in an industry that at the time, you know, most people didn't think a lot of. There was no real celebrity chefs or, you know, well-known industry professionals. Nobody's it, really Well, culturally, about we it. weren't at the no, races at no, that time. No, no, no. So it was kind of into the unknown, I suppose. Um, you know, a few questions, are you sure? Yes, okay, you go for whatever you want to do. And that's the same, the same experience for me whenever uh, I decided to go to America. So I'd actually been traveling. I, took a, I left university, went back into the industry, spent two or three years, got some really good experience of working Still with- Still bars? Bars, yeah, opened a few venues in Glasgow, which was, you know, a uh, gr great experience again that I fall back on today because I watched a great company make a lot of mistakes, I felt at the time, but you know, those are mistakes that have stayed with me and I've learned from, you know, don't do this, don't do that. And you Give know. us give us two. Uh, I'd be unfair. To, you know, probably the way that, that we were a business coming up from London and had no idea of what the culture was like within Glasgow and expected their brand just to fly and take off. And then just the level of training that was afforded to the staff members. They were coming up and trying to sell this high-end cocktail bar and the training was, I felt at the time, was probably lacking. lacking and below standard and, and um, it was difficult. So I was kind of in the middle management layer of um, trying to balance the, the kind of already paid staff and the, the, I suppose, the team of directors and, you know, you're in the middle the of The buffer. That. Yeah, yeah. It's but a tough it, place to be. Yeah, it was a tough place to be. But like, it, honestly, it was a good experience either way. Like, sometimes positive and negative experience can be equally valuable. Oh, 100%. So, yeah, uh, chances yeah. are you learn more from, from yeah. the, the tough times yeah. than you do from yeah. the good times. Yeah, and don't get me wrong. I've, we've made plenty of mistakes along the way, open yeah. venues and, and uh, whatever we've done. But there are lessons that stayed with me and that I took into the, my next immediate role, which was in the States. So I was in the industry. Uh, for a bit in Glasgow, um, went traveling, took a break, and met a couple of crazy Irish guys in Arizona. Um, funny story. Where did about. you go traveling, just as a matter of interest? <laughs> so uh, we landed in New York um, and thought that, hey, we're a couple of cool Irish dudes, just, you know, loads of bar experience. We just rock in and get a job. But I suppose you looked around in the flight and we were flying into New York and everybody else had the same <laughs> idea. And we, prob we probably arrived you know, later than everyone else. So I, I do remember this, walking around all the Irish pubs in New York and just going, getting the same answer. It's like, dude, you're the 40th guy that's been wow. in here today. You're not going to get a job in New York in summer at this stage. I think I was, I can't remember what it was, like July or something. So uh, what did we do? We decided to go to Florida. I can, I can visualize the head scratching that yeah. went on at that point. Yeah, well, well actually, we, we, we had a good time for about three I weeks I bet in you New did. <laughs> <laughs> Basically spent all of our money and then we had not no planning whatsoever. We just jumped, which went to Florida, whereabouts, West Palm Beach, that looks good, let's go there. And we flew down to Florida and realised when we got there, uh, it was their off season and they weren't really hiring. They were like, yeah, you can have a job, can you start in September? 
So then we sat on the beach for a week or 10 days and then we literally had ran out of money. And um, we were, by, were probably, what we had was a ticket home and a few quid. And uh, a friend of mine had a, a brainwave. He's like, I think I've got a cousin from Cork in Arizona. And so <laughs> we, he rang him up. No, he rang home. He says, uh, is it, Mom, do I have a cousin in Arizona? Yeah, you do. Hang on, I'll get his number. And we literally rang him and said, look, we're in Florida. We've no money. We're about to go home. He says, right, I'll call you back. And he called us back 30 minutes later and said, can you be in Arizona Monday morning? And this was Thursday, I think. And we were like, why? He goes, I've got jobs for you. <gasps> Amazing. Yeah, and so we are like, okay, hang on. So then we hung up and said, how are we going to get there? We had no money. So we, we, we've called all the airlines. There was no, like, this is early 2000s. You couldn't just jump online. I remember ringing around trying to get a last minute flight and it was an extortionate amount of money. And um, we're like, oh, we can't afford a flight. What are we going to do? And someone suggested we get a bus. So we took a bus from Florida to Arizona, which took 52 hours. Oh my God, I, I and there actually, were, the, the yeah, pain. There were, there, was, there were so many reasons why this should, trip shouldn't have happened. We ran out of money in New York and somehow landed in Florida. This guy has a brainwave of I've got a cousin in Arizona. Then we still decided, we had to get on a bus for 52 hours. And the guy that met us at the end of the bus became my business partner. Go away. Yeah. So we literally put us up in his house, we became great friends, still great friends to this day. And um, we uh, he was Irish? He was Irish from Cork. And so we, we literally... He was the cousin? He was the cousin, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we literally sat in his patio for months while we lived there and dreamed up ridiculous ideas of what would we do in Arizona for a business. And we decided to open the second ever Irish pub. And so, you know, drinking on a patio stemmed into um, a, an idea which just became infectious and we both just jumped all over it. Uh, spent the next kind of year, 18 months planning and then went back out and then... While working, presumably. Yes, to, so to so um, within three years in Arizona, we had four pubs and 120, I was 25. Wow. All of a sudden this big business. So we started from nothing. I was the industry, I suppose, expertise, they had a few quid. But literally the first pub we opened was credit cards. We did everything. Wow. We just... You know, we stretched ourselves to the absolute bone, opened the doors with no money. If we had no customers week one, we were out of business. Uh, but we made it work and thankfully... There's a great success. book called Blue Ocean Strategy. Have you come across that one? I haven't, no, no. And it's about uh, where, where, can, where can you find blue ocean in a red market, basically. Yeah. And Arizona was your blue ocean. Yeah, I think so. Like, again, you didn't realise at the time. I moved to Arizona with a three-year plan. I was like, look, I'll go out here. We'll probably get one venue open get really good experience of building a business, entrepreneurial, you know, adventure um, in a different country and, you know, maybe build something, a bit of value, get back out, come home and maybe do something ourselves. But I think my path in business has been good because I've always been able to spot an opportunity and understand mm. when you're into something really good or there's something really good in front of you. And you combine that with my own work ethic and ambition you know, if there's opportunity and ambition, like when they meet, like potent it, force, it's a great um, place to be. And and I've I've literally been on that journey now for eighteen years, nearly. You know, so um, and gained so many High valuable octane. experiences and friends, and yeah, uh, yeah. And what um, what was beguiling about the way uh, business was done in the U.S. that must have impacted how how you live your business life now. Yeah, so there's there's a few parts to that. So uh, the States is, like you probably hear this a lot, it is cheesy, but it is a land of opportunity. certainly mm. was back then for us. One of those places where what you put in, you get back out. Mm. Um, we probably had an unfair advantage, though, being Irish. <laughs> there is just a natural draw and attraction uh, because a huge portion of the population claim to have Irish heritage. And when you open the second ever Irish pub, in Arizona, it, w it was a great magnet for people of all backgrounds. So we just did really well. Um, but equally, we were very good at what we did. Um, so we knew what we were. We made a very clear commitment to that. We weren't like some type of hybrid Irish pub that didn't, you know, with TVs everywhere and selling American cheap beer. We really committed to what we were. And I think people, people really appreciated that. We were authentic. Um, you went in there every day. You saw the owner operators, like we were front and center of the business, pushing it on every day. And um, 
but yeah, the climate was right. Like the uh, Americans love eating out. They just you know love an occasion, love ent being entertained, love good food, know what they like. And so when you can build a restaurant business there and understand again the fundamentals of what makes a great business, it's really this whole industry. And, and food was integral to your yeah, we, offering we, we, there. Yeah, it was. So we we um, lunch and dinner. Uh, and then entertainment in the evening and, you know, drinking all the way through, hopefully. But uh, <laughs> no, we, 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 food was a huge part of what we did. I think it was nearly 50% of turnover in most venues. So, Amazing. Um, what was I going to say? It was, um, yeah, it was just... So, it, it, so, so, so meanwhile, how long, how long did that period last? Of building the pubs? Yeah. So it was probably, I had my head down in the pubs for about five years, mm. five, six years. And we had three pubs in Arizona and one in Florida. Mm -hmm. Um, actually went back nearly to the place where we took the bus from originally to go to within a few miles. Uh, to go You'd to have to, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's funny how that happens. Um, so yeah, probably two thousand and two to two thousand and eight. Um, I was heavily involved in the pubs, but I am one of these guys that um, when your pubs in ours, when your pubs in the states. You've so many sales people coming through the door every day, and I loved talking to them just to get an understanding of what they had, you know, what a, a bit of a sponge for other people's, mm -hmm. you know, um, sell, sell. And I used to immerse myself in things, and um, I, I really fell in love with the, the marketing and advertising side of running restaurants. And uh, a guy came in to me one day in Florida, and I thought he had a great product, and I don't think he realized how good it was, and. Um, I asked him, I said, look, um, how are you doing with this? I'm doing okay, just selling it locally. I said, I think this is great. I would love to take this product, rebrand it, and take it back to Arizona. So I did. So it was another opportunity to just walk through the front door, um, worked out a deal with those guys, took it back to Arizona, and set up another business. And that was that became my focus then for a few years, which was, was kind of on the, 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 the deal side of the restaurant marketing so it was at early days when Groupon and Living Social and things like that were up and coming and um, we had a, a version of that I would say quite loosely but um, we offered deals and to restaurants and, and it was like a dining guide where, yeah yeah so it worked really well um, and again so you had the pipeline you were just exercising another way to make revenue from it in a way um, and the network and yeah so it's just it was again it was being in your industry and seeing an opportunity within that so I then stepped out and started selling back in as opposed to being in and, and being sold to but again that was my experiences in there I was I was able to sell this as a value add to, to other restaurant owners because I used the product and believed mm -hmm. in it and loved it and knew it was right and and you know what they they hear that from you and you, they develop a level of trust and I think the products and services that we did ultimately sell in added immense value in one new customers and yeah we were doing loads of stuff but like that just spun into spun into like two other businesses like once you get in with restaurant owners they're a funny bunch they're like they want you to do more because everyone they're the busiest group of people in the world and never so they have trust time. you there's a, there's yeah, a connection and they're like, there david can you do this i need a new website fine we'll build your website we brought we had a team of developers uh, and then mobile technology at the time was taking off and um i had a Another team of developers approached us that saw us selling our product back in the restaurants and they were like, look, we've got this product. We think it's great for your industry. We're developers having a clue how to sell it. Will you sell it? And I was like, okay, let me put it in my own business and see what happens. And then it, it, it worked and I was like, absolutely, great, we go. no problem. Rebranded that and sold it back in again. And Amazing. so, yeah, it was a good journey. So uh, I think we're probably close to the bridge that brings you back at this stage. But before we get there, yeah, yeah. we're going to take a quick break. The Architects of Business on Joe in partnership with the EY Entrepreneur of the Year program. So you're basically turning into a mogul in Arizona at this stage. Oh, no, I wouldn't say that. Um, we were definitely had a few components to our business. Um, we had a lot going on and everything you know, thankfully was successful and and uh, had great momentum. But that came at a time, it was probably 2011. I remember I went to, I went to Arizona with a three year plan, mm -hmm. came five years, then it I was remember. seven, and then it was 10. And by that stage I was married and uh, married a girl from Belfast and- In Arizona. In Arizona, yeah. Well, it's another story, but we, we were- <laughs> That's a different podcast, maybe. Yeah, yeah, we, 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 we met at university and fell in love and I at university where in Glasgow go away yeah yeah fantastic yeah. so we uh, I ran off to Arizona 
and thankfully she followed me and nice. was, uh, you know, we we're still together. Nice. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so what was I doing? I was, um, we, we, we had 10 years, and there's, I think there's a natural milestone there of, okay, what are you doing next? And I think all the projects that we were involved in, like we had grand ambitions to build pubs up and down the coast of Florida. I uh, found a business plan the other day, actually. Um, we had ideas to expand the product that we had in Arizona into other markets. Um, but it, it was going to take real commitment. Mm. It was, you're it was talking, the next level. It was five years. And, uh, you know, I suppose I, personally, um, I would have loved professionally to go on that journey. Uh, it would have been exciting. And, um, but personally, um, it wasn't for us. Um, you know, we are, you know, my wife and I, you know, knew we wanted to have a family and knew we wanted our family to be close to our, our family and um, had seen other Irish expats living away without their family, with children, and how difficult that is, you know, without a support network around mm -hmm. you. And um, culturally, like we wanted our kids to come up in Belfast, and we wanted to go to schools in Belfast, and we wanted the grannies to come around and take them to school and buy them ice lollies and whatever. And so we sacrificed a lot. I think we left a lot behind in the States, but for the right reasons. Mm. So I sold up um, the pubs and other businesses, and thankfully put a few quid in the bank and came home and um kind of went okay What's what we're we gonna next? do now yeah I, I literally i didn't even try and write a plan i didn't want to go home with any pressure to do anything i just wanted to go home and put some time in the family and just um enjoy life for a little bit um but it wasn't long before we we bought a i think we bought a nursery uh, well i know we bought a nursery <laughs> <laughs> um, again, it was so opportunistic. I had no plans to buy a nursery whatsoever. A friend of ours was relocating and had built a business. It seemed reasonably good. Um, we were thinking of having a family. and I thought, This would well, be handy. Yeah, it would be handy. And it was. I haven't, I've never paid a nursery fee in my life. Hilarious. Um, but, and thankfully, it was a good little business. And we bought some property that was associated to it. And it was fine. So we just put a, a kind of different level of thinking into the business and new systems and stuff and kicked it on a bit. And uh, yeah, so that was the first thing we did when we came home, and then king of the understatement, David. Yeah, kicked yeah, it on a little bit. Yeah, yeah <laughs> no, well, so when we, as I, my the time I'd spent in the states, as you were, I was kind of studying the industry and what was happening, and talking to lots of restaurant owners through the businesses that we had, and the definitely the buzzword at the time was fast casual, and um, and so that seemed to be a great idea to me. It was it was um, certainly a sector of the restaurant industry that hadn't taken off in Ireland, uh, had received a lot of buzz and interest um, in the States. And more importantly, it looked like it would afford me the lifestyle that I wanted to have. Like one thing about Irish pubs is you'll be in there at eight o'clock in the morning counting stock and you'll be closing the doors at three o'clock in the morning, kicking people out. And that's a tough lifestyle with yeah. kids. So fast casual, Seemed and and fast fast casual to me yep. I could be wrong it, it, it seems like a very uh, industry word so I don't think that's a term that has seeped out into the public consciousness um, probably not um, as much but I think it will um, like I think the pursuit and the behaviour is there yes but the terminology is is probably quite industry still yeah I, w I would agree with that and and i think as part of our messaging this year we're going to try and close that gap a little interesting. bit interesting and own it i think so well yeah. we, we own about 20 percent of the fast casual market in ireland currently so and we've certainly created that market and others are following so you know you have um, to stake a claim to it then yeah no but not staking a claim no look it's open for everybody but like i i do think there's an educational piece of mm -hmm telling customers what they're actually participating in mm -hmm. so like fast casual if you don't know is a is a is a commitment to a kind of higher quality ingredients and a kind of level of provenance behind what you do at a really affordable price point that suits the kind of modern style of living so you know if your time if you don't have a lot of time at lunch and you still want to get something that's good that's that's good that makes you feel better that's not typically fast food or a boring sandwich, then we fill that gap. 
And um, how important is, is that quality piece and the, the goodness piece in terms of the food itself? Hugely. Uh, I mean, we have seri we, we, our brand wasn't built off this, but things that people are talking about today, we've been doing as a brand for 10 years and people just don't know. So there's a huge investment from Boujum in the highest quality ingredients all the way through our business. We buy the premium, premium class of veg. We buy, you know, Irish source proteins, the best rice we can buy. The, you know, the selection process for avocados and this classification and the, the specification, the pressure testing. Like it is, it is beyond. Rigorous. Oh, totally. And so I, let's go back a little bit because actually th this is all uh, amazing. But it, uh, to me, and I'm fascinated by this. You you came back, you bought a nursery, you grew that business, and then you identified this sector. Yes. Um, and you knew that this is the one for you from this kind of, it's almost like this, all the incremental knowledge had led to this pinpoint micro-niching of what needed to yeah. be done. So I suppose once the nursery was settled and it was more or less kind of passive income for us, we had a good little management team, we knew we wanted to get back into the restaurant space. Um, and that was in fast casual. So we we knew broadly what we wanted to do. Then we set about understanding. Okay, what is what is the concept within that? Um, and we created a, a, a kind of concept with a Southeast Asian style cuisine. Uh, spent a good few months developing menus and brands and um, a few options within that. And finally agreed upon something that we liked. And then set about. Um, kind of funding that business and also uh, finding sites, potential mm -hmm. sites for it. And there's, there's a f lots of stories within that journey that um, could have led to us not uh, acquiring Boujum. Um There were two instances where we thought we had leases agreed with landlords only for the deal to, to break down at the very last stage. And if any one of those leases had been signed, I, I probably You'd have been locked in. I wouldn't be sitting here, I don't think. I mean, hopefully maybe in a few years' time where we had grown something and, you know, uh, we had a little bit of recognition. But the the we would have been locked into something that would have required all of our focus, you know, a huge amount of funding, and it would probably wouldn't have lended itself to us doing Boujum at the same time. But anyway, so we were, we were um, actively looking for sites for a fast casual brand. Um, we also set about studying other fast casual brands um, within Belfast at the time, of which Bruzen was the most well known. Mm -hmm. So I think there were two sites at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, we studied it inside out. Like I remember, I tell a story all the time. Um, I was like, okay, I've just really got to understand what a good fast casual business, what is the potential in Belfast? Uh, what, what, does a good, what does a good day look like? So um, one of the sites that we looked at for our concept was directly opposite a Bruzen store. So we got the keys to it one day and opened the shutters and I brought a deck chair in and sat there with a clicker and counted how many people went through I love that. Um, at lunch. And I remember sitting there going, all right, you know, what can happen? I had an idea in my head and 15 minutes later, I can't remember what I got to, but I remember phoning my brother going, this is it. Yeah, this, I was like, you will not believe how many people come through. And he's like, oh, it's probably just a burst. Maybe that, you know, they, everyone arrives at 12 and then they all come at one again. But it was, it was constant. I love that So story. I was ringing them every 15 minutes and going, da, 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 giving them an updated count there. And I was like, dude, this is, I think our numbers are a bit shy here. You know, we maybe need to kick them on a bit. But we'd shown them to the bank and they, they, were, they were very supportive. But I thought after looking at this, I was like, yeah, hey, Belfast is ready for a new wave of flavour and style of eating out and the days of, you know, boring sandwiches and, you know, soup and soda bread. Yeah. And that's gone. Like, yeah. People are looking for more. They're hungry for more. Um, Boozham led the way so uh, and then we started eating their food a lot and we just developed a real passion for it and became honest fans of wow this is a great business meanwhile trying to get these leases signed and I suppose we made a little bit of noise doing that um, it was kind of you know Maxwell Brothers are back in Belfast um, there are a few people who were aware of our background in the States and one in particular which was um, my brother's uh, ex-colleague from Ulster Rugby and he had taken his first job in corporate finance, and I think we were one of his first phone calls. Wow! And he's like, he's like, listen, I I know you boys are looking for your own thing. But will you do me a favour? And we are rattling the cages deliberately. No, look, we, we don't rattle cages. It's not my style. Like I like to keep my head down and things, yeah. especially when you're working on a new concept. I think it was he probably had 
you know, access to information just because he was a friend. The um, network. We, we didn't really know what he, he was doing on the side. Yeah. Um, and it, network is right. So Rugby Network um, came through for us. But he was like, look, I know you are doing your own thing, but he goes, look, I'm just in this corporate finance gig. He goes, I'm pretty sure we talked to a restaurant owner last year about doing something. Um, would you take a look at it? And we were like, what is it? And he said, it's Boujum. And I, I was like this with a phone. You know, I was like, oh, I love that business, but I, I didn't want to let that fully known at the time. So that's how the deal kind of... So hang off. on, he was looking at it from Boujum's end. He, no, he, the, 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 he, all he had was a note that said, potential opportunity. We spoke, wow. we spoke to this restaurant owner last year um, for something, I can't remember what it was. Um, and here's, you know, two people in his network that are doing something similar. Let's see if we can make something happen. Amazing. Yeah. So I, I don't think um, it was really driven from the previous owners. Like they, I don't it was think just kismet, just happened. Yeah, yeah. It was they, well. Corporate finance jobs to put two people together yep. and make deals happen. Yep. So they did, and um, I think that was in two thousand and fourteen. Um, we set up a meeting and met the previous owners, and I think straight away what they got from us was credibility. Okay, these are credible potential buyers um, who are going to be good custodians of the business that we've built, and um, you know can actually do make the transaction happen. Um, what we got from them was, you know, a, a really dedicated um, husband and wife team who were ready to leave a business for very good reasons, and um, you know, we we agreed with them um, how the deal would work and you know, roughly what a, a valuation looked like, and then we had to go away and decide, okay, do we want to pursue? the concept that we were originally looking at or we'd want to go after Boujum and I felt Boujum was the was a better platform um for us to really an already proven proven concept. Um but it came it didn't come without risk. So it was a pretty big check that had to be written uh, to the previous owners. And so the big decisions we had were, well, letting our own concept go and then how do we actually fund this thing? So my journey of funding businesses, the first business we opened in Arizona, we literally, credit cards. We literally got down to credit cards and phone calls to mom, you know, uh, you know, you just anything and everything you, you can together. do. Total hustle. Um, the, um, and then th through the journey in the States, we, you know, once you get, you get a reasonably solid platform and- There's a tipping point. Flow. But yeah, we, 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 I think we've, we funded most things with cash in the States. That's just what we believed in. And uh, we put our cash to work and we put very little risk into the business in it from a debt perspective. Uh, I think we did one SBA loan, Small Business mm -hmm, Association. Mm -hmm. And um, so we had experience of, you know, dealing with institutional, you know, loan applications and whatnot. And, you know, equally, all, all ends of raising finance. Um, so when this deal came up, it was literally, it was about risk, really. We had, Versus you know, reward. Yeah, I, yeah, my son had just been born. He wasn't barely, I think he was one. Um, I had literally bet the house, my wife doesn't know this, but I bet the house so many times in the States, emptied the bank account to do stuff. And I just couldn't do it again um, on this, I felt. so. Um, Your wife doesn't know this. She does now. She does now. Yeah, <laughs> no, she did. I, I'm joking, I'm joking. Um, but yeah, we took a lot of risk, I suppose, mm. previously. And, and when you've got family, it changes your view, but equally, um, you know, there were, our, were other reasons why we brought in partners. So we decided to go down the private equity route. What they were going to do was reduce the check required from mm -hmm. us, um, but also add value. And we had a, a, a kind of bit of a test for private equity. It was like, once you realize um, that, you know, there's a wall of money out there, people looking to invest in mm -hmm. good businesses so they can all write a check. Um, then there's there's a couple so of it's symbiotic. Yeah, that, that you can't. There is money available, right? Yeah. And so they can already check. And the two things for me that were important were, what other value are you going to add into my business? What's going to differentiate you from this guy in Scotland who can equally write a check? And actually, would you pass a three pint test? Like, can we go and have a bit of crack? Because I don't want to be stuck in a boardroom talking about balance sheets and profit and loss statements, and you know, all the time there has to be something else in this for me. Uh, and so thankfully we, we met the guys at Renatus and they passed all three tests and 
fantastic. It, it was a it was a good combination. Um, we were actually their first investment, which was probably a great thing as well. They were on their entrepreneurial journey. They were people really think all private equity is the same. It's not. These are a couple of hardworking guys who had raised some money and set about trying to make it work and support and help grow good businesses. And you know that's I think there's a perception of private equity that is. Um, you know, it's these boring institutional guys, and they're out to, you know, take everyone else's money and steal equity, and it's, mm. that's not the case. Like it, the opportunity, it certainly doesn't have to be. And I think, I think the way business is going, there is yeah. that, that that alignment of values piece is so important. You yeah. have to be able to look somebody in the eye yeah. and know that you're on the same page yeah. and want the same thing. Yeah. So I, I have I've sat on panels before and listened to stories people. If you were in the audience, you would never do a private equity back deal <laughs> because of, because of their own personal journey. Now, yeah. like I, I have to be honest and say that mine has been excellent from start to finish because we did the work up front. Our vision was aligned. Our values were aligned. We were all similar age and backgrounds. Our, our wives met not long after, and um, you know we can have the pint test. You know, do do we discuss things? Yes. Um, do we agree on everything all the time? No, but that's yeah. good. There's challenge in the business as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and honestly, I, I, I don't think um, they added a level of ambition and backed my own ambition. I probably We probably took more risks and went harder because of that and probably gained more. So, um, so yeah. Look, and, I, I, and, and again, that's compounded. So as the yeah. business grows, that becomes bigger and yeah. bigger and bigger. Yeah. And I suppose you're... you're uh, a pretty recent uh, member of the EY Entrepreneur of the Year program. Yes. And uh, in a way, it's it's a little unfair to ask you what, what the benefits of it are, but I think you've already dipped a toe in the water and um, I'd love to get your, your thoughts on that. Yeah, look, there's probably um, lots of different benefits from, I said it before, I, I just love hearing other people's stories. I thought some of the best parts of the, the trip we had away were the breaks in the the um, agenda where their own their entrepreneurs stood up and just told their story and I love the variations in how people tell stories and I equally love the variations on people's own journey to get there with, within whatever industry they're in you know the reasons why they did it and the struggles they've had like that that is inspiring um, and do you feel a sense of um, like-mindedness amongst the group that there are commonalities there with you yeah I think so look um, certainly it is an ambitious group we're all ambitious we wouldn't be there if we weren't certainly um, you know everyone's fighting similar battles but from different angles yeah. and there are lessons to be had there so um, so like the, 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 that is definitely a benefit um, the, the, to, to take that away and understand that hey you're not the only one who's dealing with this this and this um, and it gives you a, a kind of maybe a, a, a Different context. Yeah, context, but but uh, energizing as well. Yeah, and the um, and then I suppose there are people who are doing business with each other. Um, I think there was a stat that was produced that said X percent of you know EY the alumni. Yeah, are are, are, are yeah. doing business with each other. I'm doing a tiny bit of business with one of the guys, Gareth. Those press juices better be good. <laughs> um, but no um, pressure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, there's there's definitely opportunity that way. Um, Amazing. Yeah. And and on that ambition, because I know you've been cited as saying, you know, the continued growth in Ireland, possible entry into the UK market. Yep. Uh, I know you're a long thinker because of what you've already <sighs> said. I, is there a growing and developing ambition for Boojum? Yeah, well, we're definitely long on Boozham, 100%. Um, I am um, I'm clear that the opportunity available today, available today is greater than the opportunity I saw four years ago when we bought the business, and that's really exciting. So our journey in Ireland has been has been crazy, exciting, um, difficult, um, you know, but very rewarding. Um, we've grown this business from five stores to eighteen. 120 staff to 500 staff. We've we've five x our turnover and five x our bottom line. Like there's just so many positives to come out Amazing. of that. Um, but we're not done. So um, we're still chasing some sites in Ireland. Um, definitely not as many as we've done over the last few years. It's Ireland's a finite absolutely place. But um, so we, we'll probably there's a few diamonds in the rough that we're trying to coach out a little bit uh, but but yeah I think I've said this before the next 
phase or big wave of opportunity for us is in the UK. And that's something that we're working hard at. at and, and going into that, knowing that cultural differences need to be respected. And, you know, it's yeah. wonderful to have had that experience right at the yeah. beginning to know what that yeah. looks like. Yeah. Well, the, the cultural differences, they are important, but, you know, we are a um, Mexican fast casual Democratic. Business. We're not a, 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 that, you know, the concept is proven globally. Um, thankfully, no one in Europe really owns that space. And, you know, we would love to. <laughs> I have every confidence. Yeah. David, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank, Thank you. you so much for your time. Thank you. Thanks to listening to Joe's Architects of Business, made in partnership with EY Entrepreneur of the Year. Thanks to all the team here at Maximum Studios and of course to David Maxwell. If you haven't already done so, please do subscribe to get a brand new episode of the show into your feed for free every two weeks. I'm Sonia Lennon, talk soon.